Here we go. And never quite know. It looks like we are live. Okay, welcome everyone. Joan, let me know if there's anything that indicates that we're not live. I don't actually see it yet, but that doesn't necessarily mean anything. Okay. I'm going to pretend as if we're live and we'll see how this goes. Yes, there we are. I see us on my screen. Do you see us on our screen? No. <laughs> well, okay. welcome everyone to this quick look session. Uh, I'm seeing some people joining in. Selena, Michelle, I have an extra monitor over here to, to tune in, see what you all are up to um, in the comment section. Tell me where you're at, where you're from, how your day's going. Give us something there. Nice to connect with y'all. You You're live. Yes. Okay. So today is a quick look at lessons from goldfish. My time spent in the goldfish lab. I am your uh, host of today, Ryan O. This is brought to you by Terra Nova Training Center. They are a platinum spotner, uh, platinum sponsor of our uh, chat con this year. So we're super excited. They're helping make these happen. So check them out if you're into um, what we're doing, what's going on here. They really fueled and made this possible. So I'm going to start us off with a little bit of history on where this is all coming from. So in graduate school, there was this uh, lab. And this lab was a part of Florida Institute of Technology. I went to the Orlando program, their campus there, and it was a brick and mortar campus before all this, a lot of the online stuff. They had a, there's, there's the online and then there's the brick and mortar. And I was at the brick and mortar. And we had this research lab that was adjacent to, as like a mother-in-law suite to um, the house that I was living in. And there's some cool lessons that came from this. Um, Essentially, I signed up for Florida Institute of Technology because I wanted a breadth of different opportunities and possibilities when it came to learning about behavior analysis, different roles um, and applications that it plays. During that time, actually, it was where I, I started to learn about Tag Teach International, all these other applications and different packages and forms of which um, we could take this beautiful science, get out there and help solve some socially significant problems. And the Fish Lab was a really cool place to focus on some of the, what I was learning about is the basic principles of how behavior works. Um, and particularly, this idea, this concept of learning through consequences. So I'm gonna get an example of like how we, we worked with these fish and kind of lay that foundation for you. And then we'll come back through and we're going to look at three different lessons. And I broke these down a little bit each. So this is what it looked like when we first moved in. There was a housing tank. This is just where the fish lived. There's 12 total tanks, all sized where they had their own amount of space that they needed. Looks like a complete mess here because this is day one of us moving in and starting to set things up. But what it started to turn into was a very organized system to be able to work on teaching certain skill sets. And these skill sets were kind of twofold, uh, which we'll see with this convergence theme of human and animal training. The idea that was that, that students could come in like myself and we could learn how to shape certain skill sets in the fish. Things like hitting a soccer ball into the net. You'll see that on the right side here. Um, or as I'll show you in a little bit, swimming through a hoop. And this automated hoop was to start to teach us about the basics of experimental, the experimental analysis of behavior and what we, um, how we could work with like schedules of reinforcement and just understand why we do the things that we do as species um, or as living organisms. So the... Housing center, as I mentioned here, like the, the home housing tank was where they all lived. Eventually, I was all tucked up, nice, neat, painted. I couldn't find any pictures of those. This is before I was into documenting everything in my life. We had all sorts of things. We had a reverse osmosis system. Um, there was a lot of things that were in there just to make sure everything was neat and tidy. One of the questions that comes up was like, why were you working with fish? And the long story short is that there are a... Uh, a lot of regulations when it comes to working with mammals. Uh, there's a lot of oversight, as there should be when it comes to working with research, um, working in research settings with animals. And it's very costly. 
Uh, a good example is working with mammals. You have to have routine checks by a veterinarian on those animals. And I think the average daily cost at the time for working with a pigeon was somewhere around $12 per day per pigeon. So when you think about walking that out for 365 days a year, the cost is extremely high. Now, Oh, for somebody that doesn't have grant funding was just kind of making this happen. And that's what my advisor was doing at the time. So he was just trying to make this thing happen. And so the uh, alternative was working with goldfish and it was still legal. It was, we were able to work with them. It was just a much lower overhead cost. And there was a lot less um, when it came, came to like the day-to-day -day regulations, but there were still standard practices on how you're supposed to handle things um, and how, to, how you're supposed to operate uh, your day-to-day. -day. So I started in this position where I was going to just be working on shaping these goldfish's skill sets, try to figure out how to automate these things. You'll notice the basic chamber, um, as we like the, the working chamber where we worked with these fish, uh, just had its own circulating system. It had this little grid that was on the bottom to where we made sure if food fell, that it wasn't immediately accessible. I'll get back to that later. And then a, a series of different lights for us to be able to see as well as trigger different conditions. So now a close up of what this looked like. The basics of how this worked is we were, the goal was to teach these fish how to uh, swim through this hoop so that we could set up an automated schedule of reinforcement. And what I mean by that is that we would try to see how the different, uh, how how we could work with rewards and how often we, we provided these reinforcers if that would change certain rates of behavior. So a good example is um, we know in behavioral research that something that is very intermittent, very variable, say a variable ratio schedule as they talk about it, will produce these really high rates of responding. Um, in a way, you can kind of think of this like uh, that person that texts you back every once in a while, but not every single time. Like you might text them a lot more frequently because you're kind of looking for that, but you don't necessarily know when you're going to get that feedback. Um, those sort of things apply to, uh, as we're reading, all areas of human behavior. And when it came to other species as well, pigeons, rats, was, a lot, was where a lot of that work was done. Um, so we were there to just learn about how far does this really go? Does what we're reading in the books actually translate into our um, applied work? And does it actually work with other species? And so the day to, the way that this worked was um, we were given a wand and we had to use this wand that was like a plunger. I wish that I had one. And it was just a very simple green wand that you could, based on how long you need it, kind of adjust those sort of things. And you plunge the top, and you plunge the top, the bottom would deliver a little bit of food. And the way that you did that is you just grab a little bit of the food pellets, scrunch them up just enough, drop them in the bottom of there. And then you'd get this little flicking that you would try to get down. It'll just let out a little bit each time you're trying to reinforce something. So your basic setup was that you had this operant uh, chamber, as they called it, a place to teach the goldfish, their fish tank, the training tank. And you would be sitting there and you'd be waiting for them to do something. Uh, and whatever that something was, you define it and we'd work on shaping that. So what I was interested in is uh, twofold. Could we teach them tricks, but also could we teach them how to swim through these hoops? And the reason you want to swim through the hoops is when you swim through the hoops, uh, you can automate things. So I could start to have a sensor sense when they did things and I could automate the system where I didn't have to be there with the plunger myself anymore. And so, at your basic uh, session, look like a 15 minute session where you would sit down, you'd have that plunger, you'd have something defined like the fish swimming through the hoop that you were trying to shape. And as they got closer and closer to that, you would just kind of move your target behavior a little bit each time, your reinforcement criterion, and you would shape that um, successfully until they started swimming through the hoop. Now, what this looks like, I will show a quick example here. This is one of my sweet videos that I made during the time. Can you all hear that music?
All right, so my fish is black, uh, which means it's very hard to see in this circumstance. We're going to see if I can point it out. Let's see how good he is to see. All right, so right now he's really close to, but not going through yet. If you keep your eye really close on this white hoop, you'll see a little black fish figure swim through here shortly. Boom, there he goes. He swims through, nothing happens. But on this time, again, nothing happens. But on the third time, let's see here. Swim back around, swim back around. Swims back through, and boom, you'll see this red light pops up. So when this red light pops up, that's when the reinforcer was delivered. We had these little food pellets. And so at the basic contingency here, what was going on is that the presence of the hoop with the blue light on, swimming through would be reinforced on some sort of schedule. For this, it was a variable ratio of three, so about every third time he would be reinforced. Uh, with that food pellet, that behavior of swimming through would be. And the way we signaled that was with that red light. Um, and at the basics, there were some really cool things that we learned during this. So first of all, lesson number one that we learned, operant conditioning applies to all. Learning through the consequences, these reinforcers working um, as a, and like teaching new skill sets was something that was demonstrated. We were able to see this all throughout uh, the different schedules of reinforcement, the different skill sets we were trying to, to shape up. Um, there was, as you can maybe see in this bottom right hand corner, a soccer ball and you could teach fish to actually hit the soccer ball into the net. So the point was this works with fish and it works with a lot of different organisms. This was one of the ways that we saw that. Now the next thing was, could you do it for different behaviors? I mentioned we would teach it to follow the wand initially. We would teach it to go through the hoop with that. We teach soccer. There was actually basketball hoops where you could teach them to swim up to the water and pop that out um, and into a net as well. I never taught that one, but some other colleagues did. And the biggest thing was what we had called schedules of reinforcement. And I was really interested in this because you get these different effects depending on how often you're reinforcing. And it was one of those things that if you could figure out how they work in a basic setting, then you can start to leverage them and just understand how they work a lot better when it came to the applied work that I was doing. This is not to say that a fish is the same as a human. I'll get into that a little bit later, but there's some things that we do share in common. All right. Now, some other lessons learned here. Shaping is so much of an art and as a behavioral analyst, a BCBA, uh, I might get yelled at for using this art term, but it is very hard. It takes a lot of practice. Um, I do think that you can train this very easily, um, or sorry, that you can train this as a teachable skill set. It's not like the art in the sense that you can't teach it. It just um, takes some time, some, some, some systematic um, lessons on how to do that. Now, my role shifted into teaching others how to work with these fish. And the reason was, is I was getting it down pretty well on shaping. I worked with probably 30 or 40 fish throughout the two years that I was there, a lot of those in the beginning. And uh, just to teach them different skill sets uh, and trying to understand how to shape behavior. One interesting thing that came up during this time is that your context really matters. So as a behavior analyst, I'm not used to working in water. I don't work in water. I don't have water around me. I have air around me. But in that setting, when I deliver, say, like the, the presumed reinforcer of the fish pellets, what would happen is sometimes those things would blow from the current and things like that. So I usually draw this example of, say, you're working with someone with a token system or some sort of point reward system, and you're used to just being like, hey, good job, Johnny. Here's your token or here's whatever. Let's say you're working on a skill set like sitting in a chair. So you're trying to sit in a, teach them to sit in the chair and wait. Let's say that your criterion's two minutes, they do it successfully, you go to give them your token, but imagine that token just magically kind of floats up and they stand and they grab it. The way reinforcement works, we know that the most recent thing that's happened is what's most likely to get caught in that reinforcement contingency. So in this hypothetical example, what you really reinforced wasn't the waiting, it was more likely that the standing and the grabbing, which is the opposite of the target behavior that you're actually going for. 
And the reason I give this example is that what we saw with many of the students is that you would assume that you're trying to reinforce one thing, say hitting the soccer ball in the net or swinging through the hoop. But in reality, there was some delays in the delivery of the reinforcer and issues like that that were procedurally something that the uh, the researcher, the person who was working with the fish um, was doing like differently and incorrectly. And what that would do is it would shape totally different patterns of behavior. So sometimes I'd come into this lab and we would see some folks struggling and be like, hey, do you need any help? And they're like, yeah, I'm trying to reinforce, you know, like swimming through the hoop. What they do is they go up and they nose poke a few times. They kind of like touch it and they swim to this corner and they come back and they nose poke and then they go back. And then I think they're going to go through and I messed up. But then like they, they you know, they just kind of go through this cycle. And what it is, you'd have these really elaborate chains like that, where they'd just be swimming all over this hoop, uh, or sorry, all over this tank without actually going through the hoop. And you could identify these patterns. But when you're first learning about how these things work, it's hard to identify exactly what's going on because you're just looking for, you know, in certain ways at this problem or this solution and how you're going to develop this solution. And so... This context matters is huge. I mentioned the water example. Lighting was another one. I didn't realize that the sensitivity of the light mattered so much. So in this example here, you'll see that the fish is swimming through this hoop and then the light lights up, like I said, before the presumed pellet automated, automatically drops down. And fish, believe it or not, can uh, develop this really weird pattern when you're trying to teach them to swim through the hoop. What will happen is is you'll, they'll swim up. We used to use a, uh, a very simple plastic hoop, just a round little hoop that was made out of like some tubing that you'd sit in there and you'd teach them that. And then before we would drop in the other one. And we were curious, like does stimulus generalization occur? Will they start to swim through there um, or not? And sometimes they would, but oftentimes they would stop in the presence of that hoop. And it wasn't the hoop, I'm gonna give you that much, but does anyone know anything in particular about goldfish? They perceive differently than we humans perceive. I'm gonna give this like 12, 15 seconds. Yes, Sean, on the setting events, so important. Uh, I tried working with a zebra fish or something like a zebra fish once and it whooped my butt. Um, so the spoiler alert here is that <laughs> Fish can see, uh, at least the, the species that we were working with really heavily, this Ryukin goldfish, they could see uh, infrared. And there was an infrared beam set across this hoop to be able to sense when things went. So you'll see two little dots inside of that um, inside of that hoop. So what happened is we would teach with the, the regular plastic hoop. We'd turn, put the other one in. Oftentimes you'd see generalization, like they would just swim through the other hoop, no problem. But when we turn the whole system on, they would go to like swim up to the, the hoop and they'd just stop, they'd float there. And we realized like, ah, there's gotta be this perception issue of like this thing looks like a wall as opposed to something that you could swim through. So there's some really cool lessons there on just don't assume that you uh, can fully take the perspective of whoever it is that you're working with. And I think that's something that carries over to no matter what population you're working with, we can never at the essence understand someone else's perspective perfectly. We can only act in accordance with the evidence that we have about their perspective. And even then, we just still need to test to really understand if it's their perspective or not. Um, and there's ways that we could do that. So the last point that I was going to make here, um, oh, no, there's two. So the reinforcing of successive approximations is at the heart of shaping. You're just working on shaping closer and closer steps towards the final response. So we used to work on teaching them to, uh, in the presence of the hoop, just come up and eat some food out of the hoop. Then we teach them uh, to start to follow the wand for longer and longer durations. And then we teach them to train, we train them to follow the wand up to the hoop, maybe nose poke the hoop, maybe get close to the hoop. We transfer the stimulus control from following the wand to the presence of the hoop with a certain light going on to be able to deliver that reinforcer. And during this time, there's two things that would come up. Um, the first is, is I can't prompt the fish. <laughs> like. I can't reach in there and be like, come on, buddy, and just like push them through that. That doesn't work. Um, it is, uh, I would say, very immoral, unethical sort of thing to be doing. Um, 
but it's just not a practical solution either. If anything, you're going to be punishing the behavior that you're looking to shape in the first place. Likely, I guess. It's an empirical question. But um, this, in a sense, not having my my hands and kind of having my hands tied behind my back when it came to prompting, which I was so used to doing uh, as an applied person working with people with different um, intellectual disabilities, autism, and such, was really weird at first and really beneficial to teach me this art of shaping on on you need to use your skill sets and your tools to be able to get um, more responding or sort of influencing the behavior that you're looking for, as opposed to uh, using any sort of force, even if that's a prompting strategy. Now, the last thing was the aversive properties. So I mentioned that sometimes we would have uh, fish. So someone mentioned the startle response. I think that was Sean that mentioned that. And so um, sometimes what you'd see is you'd see folks come in for the first time. They're like, I'm going to train this fish. They kind of like, I'm going to train this fish faster than anybody else has. How long does this take? I can do this in 20 minutes. And they'd be really like aggressive with like how they put the plunge or the, how they put the wand in the water and how they were trying to quickly reinforce. And what that would do is it would potentially, uh, shape up totally different behavior than what they're looking for, because this wand can have aversive properties. It could be the scary thing that just all of a sudden pops in the water, right? If you're going to take their perspective for a second, they're just kind of swimming along. They get next to this hoop per se, and then kaboom, like this splash of water, this big thing comes in, it shoots a bunch of food in your face. Like imagine walking around in your house and just like, bah, like there's a protein shakes or uh, salads flying around or whatever it is that you're going for. It's just very different and very weird. So again, a lesson on perspective and what is going on. Is there some sort of versus properties of what, what's, uh, what you're doing in your sort of procedures? The fish would tell you that um, through their behavior. All right. Now, lesson number three, we do share some differences when it comes to fish. So I mentioned this earlier that uh, we share some properties and the similarities are really easy. Um, what that is is we both learn through consequences. We both learn through punishment. We both learn through uh, reinforcement. We learn through the consequences, the things that come after our behavior. They shape us. Now, with that said, although we learn through consequences, humans have language that leads to superstition and inaccurate rules. So like I mentioned, sometimes people would say, uh, you know, like I need some help in the lab here. Oftentimes we'd get, my fish is broken. You know, it was, it was used as a joking, you know, like nice way to say like something's going on here. But sometimes people really believe like their fish wasn't the same as other fish. And often all that was is what you had thought the contingencies were, weren't actually the contingencies that they were actually laying out in the real world. Um, for that fish. So you thought that you were reinforcing getting closer to the hoop, but really what you're doing is when they got closer, this big thing splashed into the water and it scared them and it actually created this avoidance response and got them to turn away from that hoop. So it wasn't that their fish was broken. It was that procedurally what you were doing had to be altered so that you can get uh, the behavior that you were looking for. Um, now, so yeah, there's two ways. So I want to bring up the first one there to summarize is just that uh, you could create some superstitious rules as to why you thought that fish were behaving differently when at the end of the day, they were operating under the same principles as human behavior. In this regard, uh, their consequences that they uh, interacted with affected their future behavior. But humans are also different that we do have language, like things like this webinar. I haven't seen a goldfish hold a webinar. Um, I'm sure there's a YouTube video that makes it look as if they've held a webinar, but clearly our language has been a differentiator especially in the behavioral literature on helping us um, to build things, engage in different cognitive types of tasks. And we know that there's those differences. Um, so I didn't want to say that those didn't necessarily matter here, um, but it was a good example on learning where those differences were. Sometimes you thought your fish was broken when it really wasn't broken. Often, uh, I think there was over... 200 fish in the two years that I was there and not one of them wasn't able to learn through consequences. Um, so it's a good example that uh, for students and myself as well, that these sort of things are similar, but we do have our differences in some ways. Um, now the last point here, human to animal uh, interaction. So I have this bi-directional arrow and the point is, is that um, it will get you to think 
So human animal provides a different experience and forces you to work and think differently. So there, this is kind of a summary point of the different things that I experienced during that time got me to think um, differently than if I'd only worked when say like a human to human setting. So the fact that I wasn't able to prompt is a good example. The fact that there was water that was interacting in the setting, right, of where I was working, these things I would never experience in the human setting. Experiencing them here had this weird at first, but really clear reason um, as to why I should be doing this sort of stuff because it got me to think differently, think outside of the box when it came to applied settings. Most importantly, looking at the perspective um, as they were experiencing the contingencies rather than what I thought or my language was telling me the contingency should be. So oftentimes what we think the contingency is, isn't necessarily the actual contingency that's operating on their behavior. So, um, first of all, is there any questions before I jump into a few other wrap up points? Um, I was hoping I wasn't too technical on here. I've said contingency a whole lot, um, way too many times actually. So I'm looking at the comment section, look in the comment section. Um, what else do we have here? Okay. So if you're just tuning in, I want to do one more shout out. Terra Nova Training Center is the one that's helping us bring these and make these possible. They're a platinum sponsor for upcoming Convergence of Human and Animal Training and Technology Conference in Seattle, July 20th through 21st in this year uh, that Joan and I uh, and Tag Teach International partnered up to put on. We're super excited about it. Now, let's see. I may have one other video here for you all. Let's see if this one, how this one looks. So this is like early internet days. Let's watch this and maybe I'll describe what's going on. Ah, cool. It's just a close one you can see. Ah, and there's the, okay. I'm going to narrate this one more time. So you'll see that it's chasing some sort of food, snags up some food. It's a good example of that super, that inadvertent reinforcement or bootleg reinforcement that you get sometimes. So that's actually not helping us with swimming through the hoop because they're swimming away from it. But you'll see it goes through and boom, I'll pause it. You can see the little wand that comes in there, the little plunger to be able to deliver the food. Um... Cool, Teresa McCann. Uh, thank you, Lena, for the, the comment on the perfect balance. I was just watching Greg Hanley talk and he's the most eloquent speaker I've ever seen ever in behavior analysis. I think when it comes to dancing between technical and non-technical, you can speak to both audiences at the same time. So I feel like I'm doing horrible here. Um, Teresa, yes, so this R2 fish school is uh, like a 30 or $40 package thing that you can buy online to where you can start teaching these sort of things. Highly recommend it to anybody that's interested in learning about this. We used to have our BACB uh, supervision, uh, like mentees and supervisees do this as part of uh, what we were uh, teaching them on just because you could see and learn so much from these. Um, it's available online. I'm sure we can go link it or find it. They have some videos as well. And, um, there is some more on the old fish lab. I guess to wrap that up, it was uh, informally, I think, shut down for a little bit and disconnected from Florida Institute of Technology because the professor had moved uh, positions. And so it's still going on somewhere. I don't know where. Um, there's kind of this large gap in experimental applied, or sorry, experimental analysis behavior locations where people can go learn these sort of skill sets. So the R2 Fish School is a really cool place where you can just like pick it up and learn on your own. Um, and just like put the learning in your own hands in that case, because uh, they're just really hard to find these opportunities. Um, <laughs> whoa, 72 bucks? Um, that's kind of crazy. I mean, the lessons you're going to learn from that $72 are invaluable. Um, seriously invaluable. So I would consider checking it out. 
let's see here. Um, Joan, I think that's all that I have. I don't know if I didn't do any of it justice. If I missed any comments, let me know if you want to hop on. No, oh, that was awesome. Cool. Thank you. I think it was very, uh, like Lena said, a good balance for technical versus non-technical. I think the word contingency is allowed. Okay. Pretty much uh, everybody in this field should understand that word. So, yeah, I just said the word should. I said that was a bad word. You know, what's funny is uh, <laughs> I'm used to scripting out my videos nowadays. So when I'm just riffing on this, I'm like, I feel like this funny, uncomfortable. <laughs> no, that was good. It was it's just all Ryan. Good. Normal yeah. Ryan. Everybody liked it. Uh, normal Ryan, yeah. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, maybe we could have some love for Ryan there in the comments. Um, man, what else? The love button over and over. Yeah, Brendan, it's nice to see you in here. Brendan was part of that. Um, at one point, he came into the fish lab a few times. The, uh, what else was I going to say? Oh, we started working with pigeons a little bit. Um, but again, the cost was just too much. So we ended up not building that out. Um, but we did get an operant la chamber at one point uh, for working with pigeons. So well, here's I guess. A good question. Sorry, cool. Ryan, here's a good question. Where is Convergence ChatCon 2019 and 2020? In 2020, are we releasing in this? 20, in 2019 first. Both. Oh, 2019 is in Seattle. That's confirmed. You can definitely come check that out. Um, I can't necessarily guarantee that the sunset and it's going to look that beautiful, but that's where we're going to be. It is a good time of year. 2020, are we releasing our thoughts on that? Um, yeah, well, we're thinking about it. We're definitely doing it. Uh, <laughs> it's about definitely, the coast, the it's definitely happening, and we're, we're trying to make the East Coast happen. I get a lot of crap from people. I'm like, why isn't there next gen or other sort of conference things going on the East coast that you're part of? Um, and Joan suggested we do the East coast. So I was like, yeah, that's a good idea. Cause people give me a hard time that we're always on the West coast for some of the stuff that I do. Yeah. Somewhere nice like Maine. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to grab a, see if I can grab a book real quick. If anyone's interested in the, uh, here it is. So if anyone's watching this at any point and you're like, ah, oh, you're working with animals as a research, uh, in a research setting, there's this really cool book that we used to base things off of laboratory animals and research in teaching the ethics, care and methods, um, an edited book that we followed. So if anyone wants that, it's extremely pricey. I think it's like a hundred bucks, but if you're, you're thinking that we didn't follow those things, um, we did, it was pretty cool, uh, to learn about that area. I think that's all I have, Joan. Okay, good. So next time it's going to be Shauna from, Oh yeah. From, uh, what's the name of their, what's their name again? Terra Nova. <laughs> Terra Nova, that's it. Yeah, so yeah. Terra Nova um, is going to have a guest uh, quick look. Do you, do we know the topic yet? Can we tease yeah, that? Not yet, but it's going to okay. be awesome. She's amazing, amazing horse trainer, but also a people trainer, of course, because she teaches the people as well as the horses. So we should get some really great insight from her. Cool. So we'll let you know that when that is. Um, again, here's the dates for the event. Terra Nova, big thank you. I will share the YouTube links to all the videos that I had in here. There was one other that we found during this time uh, that Joan sent me from uh, Karen Pryor. So if you guys want to see like an old school video uh, that was put together pretty well on, on training fish with that R2 system, it's going to be linked as well. Thanks for y'all's time. Hey, thanks. All right. Catch you all later.